Hi, welcome to my channel Cardiology and Beyond. I'm Dr. Sonali, an interventional cardiologist from India. Today's video is a continuation of the series on wide complex tachycardia. Don't forget to watch part 1 of wide complex tachycardia in which I've tackled the introduction to how the P waves and the QRS are dissociated from each other in cases of ventricular tachycardia and in part 2 we'll be dealing with mainly the morphology of the QRS complexes when it comes to differentiating between VT and SVT with aberrancy. So for mind mapping today's video, here are the questions for today, uh, starting from checking the QRS morphology and axis. So these are all the questions that you have to ask yourself when you are tackling an ECG with wide complex tachycardia in addition to the first three questions of the part one on the video series. So here is an overview of all these questions to ask. We've already dealt with the first three as I mentioned before, so let's start tackling the others. Before going into the differences in the morphology between ventricular tachycardia and SVT with aberrancy, it is important first to know why is the morphology normal in a normal person with a narrow QRS and why is the morphology aberrant in a case of bundle branch blocks. So when it comes to a normal person, when you have an impulse which travels from the SA node to the AV node and down the his G system, you have to realize that the stimulation of both the left ventricle and the right ventricle is simultaneous. And this simultaneous stimulation leads to a narrow QRS on the ECG, which is normal. So if you look here, initially these blue arrows point to the septal depolarization, which always occurs from left to right in a morphologically normal heart that is when the LV is on the left side and the RV is on the right side that's when the septal depolarization occurs from left to right. So that is the first event which takes place and that is seen on the precordial leads as such. Now V1 is the first precordial lead and V6 is the lateral most. So when you have an initial septal depolarization it leads to a small R wave in V1 because this this impulse goes towards V1, so it is positive in V1. At the same time, because this impulse of the septal depolarization is occurring away from lead V6, which is the precordial lead, you get a small Q wave in the initial part of this QRS complex. Thereafter, after the septal depolarization, there is simultaneous stimulation of both the ventricles. However, because the left ventricular mass is so large and because it is a dominant ventricle as compared to the right ventricle, most of the summation of the impulses are towards the left ventricle. As a result, in V1, you get a negative wave called the S wave because the majority of the impulses are now towards the left ventricle and it is away or in the opposite direction from the first lead that is V1. On the other hand when it comes to V6 most of the impulses are pointing towards V6 and hence after a, an initial small Q wave you get a positive R wave. So this is what happens in a normal person. Now when it comes to the stimulation pattern in bundle branch blocks Instead of being simultaneous stimulation, it is a sequential stimulation of the left ventricle and right ventricle depending on which bundle is blocked. And that is the one which contributes to a wide QRS complex. For example, if you take a right bundle branch block wherein the right bundle is either blocked or the conduction is delayed because it is such a flimsy bundle, what happens is the initial septal stimulation or the septal depolarization is normal because this depends on the patency of the left bundle branch which is intact. After the initial septal depolarization, then the normal left bundle branch takes over and easily depolarizes the left ventricle. And it is only after this that the aberrant depolarization through the muscles of the right ventricle occurs because of the delayed or the blocked conduction 
from the right bundle so this is the sequence of depolarization that takes place in a right bundle branch block first septal then over the left ventricle and lastly a slow delayed depolarization over the right ventricle when it comes to a left bundle branch block here you can see that a left to right septal depolarization is not seen as we see in the right bundle branch block or in normal cases so what happens first is an initial right ventricular depolarization takes place because the right bundle is intact thereafter there is an aberrant and slow septal conduction or depolarization through the muscle of the septum because the left bundle is now blocked so there is a slow advancing depolarization which takes place first over the septum followed by an advancing depolarization through the left ventricle so this is the sequential stimulation which takes place in the case of a left bundle branch block now that we've understood the sequential stimulation that takes place in bundle branch blocks let's see exactly what is the morphology which we get especially in leads v1 and v6 in these blocks now when it comes to right bundle branch block the initial septal depolarization is seen as a small r wave in v1 v1 is towards the right side of the precordial leads and it is pretty much above the septum so it receives these depolarization waves as a positive waveform and this is as small r thereafter there is a normal depolarization of the left ventricle through the normal left bundle branch and that leads to an s wave in v1 because it is now away from lead v1 and the last event which is the third event which occurs is the slow depolarization of the right ventricle because of right bundle branch block and hence we get an r prime which is a larger positive waveform in v1 so we get an rsr pattern in v1 at the same time when you look at lead v6 which is towards the left lateral side or the left side of the precordial leads you initially get a prominent r wave sometimes a small q wave can be seen because of the septal depolarization sometimes it may not be seen uh, but then thereafter you get a prominent r wave because of this normal left ventricular depolarization which is towards v6 so you get a positive waveform and towards the end the third pattern of right ventricular depolarization is represented in v6 as a slow slurred s wave so remember in rbbb in lateral leads especially in v6 or v5 or sometimes in high lateral leads like 1 and avl you've got to get a slow s wave after the r wave if that is not there then it is not a typical morphology of a right bundle branch block let's see the morphology that we get in a typical left bundle branch block now the initial waveform is small r in v1 because of the normal right ventricular depolarization via the normal right bundle now since the mass of the right ventricle as compared to the left ventricle is quite small the r wave is not that big as a result in lead v6 which is the lateral precordial lead you might not get the s wave which is expected to be seen because the mass of the right ventricle itself is pretty small and also the lead v6 is dominated over by the other forces over the left ventricle especially when it is being supplied by a left bundle which is now not working very well the next wave form is this depolarization wave form as i mentioned before which is an abnormal slow depolarization over the septum and the rest of the left ventricular myocardium so that is depicted as a deep s wave in v1 so v1 shows an a small r and a large s wave at the same time in lead v6 we get a fragmented positive wave form called r and r prime because of this slow depolarization and the direction of this slow depolarization is towards lead v6 so this is the typical morphology in left bundle branch pattern and this particular 
morphology in lead V6 and sometimes seen in 1 and AVL also is known as the typical M pattern. So we get an M pattern in V6 in left bundle branch block and an M pattern or an RSR prime pattern in lead V1 in right bundle branch block. Now let's have a look at the QRS morphology which is encountered in ventricular tachycardia in order to differentiate it from what is seen in bundle branch blocks. Now in ventricular tachycardia we usually have a focus from which this tachycardia arises and it is usually a re-entry focus. Most commonly it arises from the left ventricle but it can also arise from the right ventricle. So when you have a focus for example here from the left ventricular myocardium then we get these impulses which emanate from this focus. So if you look at lead V1 and V6, we can make out that when it arises from left ventricle as compared to right ventricle, most of the impulses are now coming towards V1. So we would expect to see positive complexes in V1. On the other hand, when you have a focus which comes from the right ventricle, all of these impulses are directed towards the lateral side, towards the left lateral side. So you would expect to see more positive impulses towards the leads which are in the left lateral region. But more commonly, when you want to differentiate within the left ventricle, there can be two possible focus of ventricular tachycardia. The more common one is an apical focus. For example, following an anterior wall myocardial infarction, you get a scar tissue here and then that starts giving out ventricular tachycardia rhythm. So when you have a focus which comes from the apex, you will see that this focus is going away from all the precordial leads. When it goes away from all the precordial leads, that is V1 to V6, you will get a negative concordance, that is all the QRS complexes will be negative in all of these leads. You will not get a normal progression of R and S across the precordial leads, which happens in normal people. Or you will not also get the typical morphologies that you would encounter in a typical bundle branch block. On the other hand, if you have a focus which is at the base of the left ventricle, then its impulses will go towards the precordial leads that is V1 to V6. So all the precordial leads will have a positive inscription of the QRS complexes. So this is known as positive concordance. Now let's finally come to the morphology of ventricular tachycardia which is seen in precordial leads and this is in contrast to the morphology that we get with SVT with bundle branch block aberrancy, either right bundle branch or a left bundle branch block aberrancy. Now when you have an aberrant rhythm which contributes to a wide complex tachycardia, the morphology of this bundle branch block aberrancy rhythm is quite similar to what we see in a typical bundle branch block. For example, in a right bundle branch block, you get an RSR prime pattern, which we've already seen, where the second R prime is greater than the first R. And in V6, we get an RS pattern where the S is slurred. In left bundle branch block morphology, you get a small R and deep S in V1. And in V6, you get an M pattern or an RR prime pattern. All right. Now let's come to what is seen in ventricular tachycardia. Now VT can arise either as an RBBB-like morphology or an LBBB-like morphology. It is like the blocks but it is not having an exact morphology of the blocks. So let us see. When you have a RBBB-like morphology in V1, it will also have RSR prime pattern. But in this case, the first R will be greater than the second R prime, which is opposite to what we see in a typical RBBB. This is also known as, an, as a rabbit ear-like appearance. On the other hand, sometimes it can also arise as a monomorphic positive R wave in lead V1. Now in V6, there are three different possibilities of morphology. There can either be a positive R wave in V6 without any S wave or there can be a QS complex, completely negative uh, waveform or there can be a small R and a deep S. So the important point to remember is that when you have a QS complex, especially in lead V6 or in lateral leads, then you have to consider that that particular wide complex tachycardia could be because of ventricular tachycardia.
What about a ventricular tachycardia which presents as an LBBB like morphology? Now, like a typical LBBB in lead V1, a ventricular tachycardia complex will be having a small R and deep S pattern. But remember that there will be a lot of slurring or a lot of delay between this first wave and the second wave form and there may there may also be some notching in between in this descending limb of this QRS complex. When it comes to lead V6, there could be several of these possibilities. The morphology could either be a small Q capital R or a, or a large Q capital R or a capital R and a small S or sometimes it will just be a negative complex in the form of QS and remember Whenever there is a QS complex, just like in the previous example, it points more towards the possibility towards a ventricular tachycardia. Now, after morphology comes the QRS axis. Now, a typical right bundle branch block or a left bundle branch block, which arises as an aberrant rhythm, is usually associated with left axis deviation. An association with right axis deviation is quite unusual unless, of course, there is right ventricular hypertrophy associated with it. In ventricular tachycardia, what happens is that you get this particular combination. You can either get a right bundle branch bl block like morphology with a left axis deviation or a left bundle branch like morphology with a right axis deviation. Or sometimes the axis will be a northwest axis, which is seen with a left bundle branch like morpholo morphology, which is an example of an extreme right axis, and as a result, it falls in the northwestern zone. So, the key point here to remember is in ventricular tachycardia, the QRS morphology and axis show a discordant pattern when there's a right bundle branch block there is left axis. When there is left bundle branch block, there is right axis. Another important point is to compare the tachycardia ECG with a baseline ECG. If there has been a change in axis during tachycardia as compared to that of the baseline, then it points more towards the possibility of ventricular tachycardia. The next point, that is the fifth point, is to look at the onset of R to S nadir in precordial leads. So what does that mean? It means that you have to see how much time it takes from the beginning of the R wave to the peak of the S wave in precordial leads and more commonly it is seen in lead V1. It can also be seen in V6 but mostly you see it in lead V1. Now the concept here is when it comes to SVT with aberrancy, most of the QRS finishes in early time because of early rapid activation of the ventricles. Since there is no depolarization through a myocardium because of a ventricular focus, an SVT finishes off its depolarization pretty quickly. As a result, the early part, that is this timing from the onset of R to the nadir of S, is quite fast. It hardly takes any time for it to finish this. On the contrary, when it comes to a ventricular tachycardia, the early part of the QRS is delayed and this is an important concept which is applicable in all the leads. Always it takes a longer time for the ventricular tachycardia focus to depolarize through a myocardium so it takes a long time for the QRS to be completed and so it is a delayed QRS. So let's have a look. When you measure a small beginning of this small r to the peak of this s it if it is more than 70 milliseconds then it is more likely to be a ventricular tachycardia even if you measure the duration of this small r by itself if it is longer than 30 milliseconds then also it points to the possibility of ventricular tachycardia and as i've mentioned before a notch in the downslope of this QRS complex also points towards the possibility of a ventricular tachycardia. The next two points that I have highlighted are 
to see how tachycardia begins and to see how tachycardia ends. Now, these two are extra clues that you can collect if you're lucky enough to have a ECG strip or a monitor, monitor strip which shows how this tachycardia started and how it was terminated. So, for example, if a tachycardia begins with a premature ventricular complex and the tachycardia has the same morphology as this first PVC, then it is obviously a VTAC. Now, when you have PVCs, they happen or they occur irrespective of the underlying sinus rhythm. So, you are able to march out the P waves through these wide complexes. And we've already seen this concept in the first part of the video series on wide complex tachycardia. If you have a wide complex tachycardia which begins with a PAC, which is a premature atrial complex, which is aberrant, that means it is wide. And if it has the same morphology, that is if the tachycardia has the same morphology as this aberrant PAC, then it is an SVT. So how do you know whether it's a PAC or a PVC? So when you have, an, if, when you have a premature atrial complex, you have a premature P wave. So you have a different P morphology. Or sometimes the P wave occurs so early that it deforms the preceding T waves. So these are the various clues that you have regarding a PAC. Now this example I've already shown in the first part of the video series in which the first beat is a PVC and the rest of the tachycardia is similar to this first beat and you are able to march out these P waves at regular intervals through this run of tachycardia right you can march it right in and march it right out so you know that there is AV dissociation and this is a PVC which has set off this tachycardia so it is a short run of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. Next is how a tachycardia ends. Of course, this is not as useful as how a tachycardia begins. It's less useful, but yet it can give you some clues if you happen to see the termination of a wide complex tachycardia. For example, if it ends with a QRS, unfortunately, it could be either of the two. It could either be a VT or an SVT. If it ends with a P wave, then it could still be either of the two, but you have to remember certain caveats. If you have seen a retrograde VA conduction in that ventricular tachycardia, and as I've mentioned in the first video of this series, a retrograde VA conduction occurs in ventricular tachycardia when its rate is not very fast. When the rate is less than around 170 beats per minute, then you have a retrograde conduction from the ventricle to the atria and you get a P wave which occurs after the QRS complex leading to a 1 is to 1 ventricular atrial relationship. So even if there is a ventricular atrial relationship and even if it is 1 is to 1, there is no apparent AV dissociation, it is still ventricular tachycardia at a slower rate and when it ends, it should end with a P wave. The second possibility of a wide complex tachycardia ending with a P wave is an SVT with aberrancy, but it does not include an atrial tachycardia because automatic atrial tachycardias do not end with a P wave. Second, another possibility is when the ending of a wide complex tachycardia, if it occurs with a premature P wave, then it is definitely not a ventricular tachycardia. Then it is always some cases of SVT with aberrancy except of course an atrial tachycardia because an automatic atrial tachycardia will never end with any kind of P wave. Let's take an example of a wide complex tachycardia run and try to see how we can understand this tachycardia from the point of view of how it begins and how it ends. So this is a run of tachycardia. Before that, let's just have a look at the baseline ECG. There are certain baseline complexes here. So baseline complexes are also wide. Here you can see V4, V5, V6. There is a left axis deviation, wide complexes where there is sinus rhythm. All right. Now let's look at this long lead 2 and try and figure out how this tachycardia has begun. So here you have a PQRS, PQRS, sinus rhythm, another sinus rhythm, 
and then you have this run of tachycardia. So when you have this first wide, wider complex or the first beat which, uh, which begins this tachycardia, here you will see that this particular T wave is looking taller than all the other T waves. That means we have a premature P wave which has gone inside the T wave and has led to the starting of this tachycardia. So just by looking at how it has begun, we know that it has started with an aberrant premature atrial complex because of this weird morphology of the T wave. So off the bat itself, we can say that this is not likely to be a ventricular tachycardia and it is an SVT with aberrancy. So now this tachycardia continues for a few runs and if you look at it, after this QRS complex, you get this small inscription here which is possibly a P wave. So you have a VA conductance, VA, VA, possibly a VA conductance here and when it ends, this tachycardia is ending with a QRS complex. So we have a wide complex tachycardia which has begun with a premature P wave. This wide complex is a bit wider than the baseline complex but it has not changed the axis. And this tachycardia is showing some VA conduction. When you have a VA conduction, you would expect a ventricular tachycardia to end with a P wave, but here it has ended with a QRS. So definitely all the points are towards SVT with aberrancy and not towards a ventricular tachycardia. The eighth point that you look for is concordance of the QRS complexes in precordial leads. Of course, this concordance, either positive or negative, is not seen in every case of ventricular tachycardia. But if it is present, then you know for sure that this is likely to be VT over SVT with aberrancy. As I've already explained in the prior section, when you have a focus of VT, which comes from the basal portion of the left ventricle, that means it comes from the posterior wall of the vent ventricle, then the focus releases its impulses which go towards the precordial complexes. As a result, since it is towards these complexes, all the precordial complexes will show a positive concordance. So here you can see V1, V2, V3, 4, 5 and 6 all are positive. Of course, if you look at V1, since it is positive, it is an RBBB-like morphology, but when you look at V6 and then you look at all the precordial complex, there is no progression of the, P of the QRS complexes and there is no typical RBBB-like morphology and the fact that there is complete positive concordance points to the possibility of a ventricular tachycardia. On the other hand, when you have an anterior focus, for example, after a myocardial infarction at the apex, then this focus releases its impulses which go away from the precordial leads and as a result, all the precordial leads will show negative complexes which is known as negative concordance. Now, the only exception to this is when you have a supraventricular tachycardia which goes over as an anti-grade conduction through a left-sided accessory pathway, that is, if you have an anti-grade conduction, suppose you have a accessory pathway on the left side, for example, you have a pathway here, which helps to communicate impulses from the LA to LV, here also, with anti-grade conduction, all the impulses will go towards the precordial leads and that can lead to a positive concordance in the ECG. The ninth point is to compare with a baseline ECG if it is available. Now, this is a very useful clue to tell you the etiology of the wide complex tachycardia. So, what are the points that you have to look at when you look at a baseline ECG? Number one is QRS duration at baseline. Now, I've already discussed this in the first part of the video series is that, for example, if you have a baseline QRS duration which is wide and if the tachycardia has a QRS duration which is relatively narrower, then it could still be ventricular tachycardia. The second thing to look for is for any baseline bundle branch blocks. That means that if you have a typical bundle branch block at baseline and if the same morphology is seen during tachycardia, then it could more likely be because of SVT with aberrancy. The next point to look for is for the axis. 
if there is any change in axis during a tachycardia with respect to that of the baseline, then it could be a ventricular tachycardia. The next point to look for is pre-excitation, that is the presence of a short PR interval and a delta wave, which is the initial slurring of a QRS complex. The presence of pre-excitation points to the presence of an accessory pathway, and if you have a wide QRS tachycardia, it could be because of an antidromic conduction, that is conduction of impulses down the accessory pathway into the ventricles. The last thing that you, you have to look for in a baseline ECG is for the presence of any P waves or any abnormal P waves. Now, for example, let's take a look at this ECG. So on the left side, we have a wide complex tachycardia ECG and on the right side, we have its baseline ECG. Let's look at the tachycardia ECG first and try to assess it by going through these questions. Number one, is it really wide complex? Yes, it is. It's more than 120 milliseconds. Is it regular or irregular? Well, it is fairly regular. Look for P waves. P waves are not seen in this ECG, so that's not going to be useful. Fourth point is to look for the QRS morphology and axis. Well, the axis is normal, so that's out of the way. Let's look at the morphology. It is an LBBB-like morphology here in V1, but if you look at the lateral leads, it is quite similar to the morphology of a typical LBBB. So this is a typical left bundle branch block morphology. There's an M pattern here in lateral leads. Look at next point is the onset of R to S nadir in precordial waves. So in precordial leads, so if you look at V1, it doesn't, of course, I'm not able to blow this up, but it doesn't look as if the initial part is slurred too much. So it looks to be quite narrow. See how the tachycardia begins, see how it ends. We don't have any means of knowing that, so that is out. Look for concordance. So is there any concordance? Well, no, because there are R and S complexes in the precordial leads. It is negative here. Then it is showing a transition here in V4, V5, in V5 rather. So there is no evidence of any positive or negative concordance. So that is not useful. And the ninth point is to compare with a baseline ECG. So let's compare it with a baseline ECG. So in a baseline ECG, let's look at the axis first. The axis is normal and let's look at the morphology. There is no left bundle branch block morphology at baseline. So there's no baseline LBBB, but there is a typical LBBB morphology in the tachycardia. All right. After that, let's look for the P waves. But here you cannot make out any typical P waves. It is not a sinus rhythm. And if you look at lead V1, here you can see something of a sawtooth like appearance. So this is actually a flutter wave. There is an undulating baseline here. There is no isoelectric segment. The segments are moving throughout. There is no segment which is straight. So it is known as an undulating baseline. And this is a flutter wave. This is one and this is the second and this is the third. So it's quite possibly that this is atrial flutter. And if you look at this particular complex that is in V4, V5, V6, there has been a one is to one conduction of this flutter wave leading to this aberrant complex, which is quite wide. So let's compare this aberrant complex which, with the ones here, and it looks quite similar to it. So at least the V4 complex looks similar to the V4 in tachycardia. So there is some aberrancy. So more likely than not, this is a one is to one atrial flutter with a rate which is quite high of around 250 beats per minute and that's how atrial flutter uh, beats when it uh, conducts in a one is to one fashion. So this is an atrial flutter which has come as a wide complex tachycardia because of rate related left bundle branch block aberrancy. I call it the 10th question to ask when you're looking at a patient with wide complex tachycardia, but ideally this should be the first thing to ask when you're looking at a patient of wide complex tachycardia, that is to look for blood pressure and then to examine the jugular venous pulse to look at for cannon waves. So the first point is when there is hemodynamic instability, it does not differentiate ventricular tachycardia from SVT with aberrancy. There are many cases where 
SVT with aberrancy can present with hemodynamic instability and there can be cases where ventricular tachycardia is hemodynamically stable. But it's important to look at the blood pressure to know which patient requires early treatment. The second thing is on a JVP you get cannon waves. These are A waves but they are different from the typical prominent A waves that you get normally. The typical A waves which occur occur in end diastole but these cannon waves are a systolic phenomenon. How do they occur? There is a forceful atrial contraction that is an atrial systole against a closed tricuspid valve. So when the valve is closed that means ventricular systole is going on. So you have both atrial as well as ventricular systole and the atrial contraction which is produced produces a very large wave known as a cannon wave and it presents as neck pounding. Now when these cannon waves are regular then the cause is likely to be a, an SVT with aberrancy and when the cannon waves come intermittently or are irregular then because of AV dissociation then the cause is ventricular tachycardia. So only when the P waves which contribute to this atrial contraction fall during a ventricular systole or during a QRS that's when these irregular cannon waves will be seen. Another way in which you can look for AV dissociation clinically is when you get a variable pulse and the first heart sound despite a regular rhythm which you look at the monitor on or, or on an ECG. That's when you have to suspect a ventricular tachycardia. Now there are a couple of criteria which are quite famous when it comes to differentiating VT from SVT with aberrancy. The first one is what is Brugada's criteria. Now if there is any one of these present then it is likely to be a ventricular tachycardia over an SVT with aberrancy and it has good sensitivity and specificity to diagnose a ventricular tachycardia. So number one is absence of RS complexes in precordial leads which is the presence of either positive or negative concordance in the precordial leads. Second is an onset of QRS to a nadir of S more than 100 milliseconds in at least one lead. Third is the presence of AV dissociation as we saw in the first part of this video series. And fourth is the morphology criteria of VT seen in both V1 as well as V6. So if anyone is present, it is more likely to be a VT. How does lead AVR provide further clues? Now what is so special about lead AVR? This lead is the only lead in a 12 lead ECG which has all its complexes that are negative that is P, Q, R, S and T all are negative and it is present over the right shoulder of an individual. Now when you have an SVT with aberrancy, now the impulses of an SVT with aberrancy are going to go down and away from AVR. So AVR will have a negative waveform just like what is seen in normal people. If you have a ventricular tachycardia for example here at the apex, it will give rise to impulses which go towards AVR so it can give rise to a positive QRS complex in AVR. So the lead AVR gives rise to certain criteria which are described in this paper. You can read it for further details and there are four such criteria. Number one is if the initial R wave in AVR is present, a capital R wave is present, then it is more likely to be a VT. Second, if there is an initial small r or a small q, then measure its duration. If the duration of this small r or small q is more than 40 milliseconds, then it is more likely to be a ventricular tachycardia. For example, here we have a small q wave, but its duration is more, more than 40 milliseconds, then it is more likely to be a ventricular tachycardia. Even if the QRS is negative in lead AVR, but if there's a notch on the descending limb of this negative QRS, then it is more likely to be a VT. The fourth criteria is something known as a VI upon VT ratio. Now, what does it stand for? VI is a ventricular activation velocity in the form of voltage, that is millivolts, in the initial 40 milliseconds, 
and Vt is the ventricular activation velocity again in the form of millivolts in the terminal 40 milliseconds. So when you have any QRS in, v, in, in lead AVR, divide it in the first 40 milliseconds and the terminal 40 milliseconds. So when you compare the vertical measurement in the form of millivolts, that is voltage of the first 40 milliseconds and the last 40 milliseconds, you get a ratio. So VI is this voltage, this measurement, vertical measurement and VT is this vertical measurement and if this ratio is less than or equal to 1, then it is more likely to be a ventricular tachycardia and why is this? The concept is the same. When you have an SVT with aberrancy, most of its depolarization finishes in the first 40 milliseconds or in the early part of a QRS. So you will have this peak in the early part of this QRS. So VI will be greater than VT. So the ratio will be more than 1 in SVT. On the other hand, when you have ventricular tachycardia, there will be a lot of initial slurring and then it will peak towards the latter part of the QRS. As a result, you will have a smaller voltage in the initial part of the QRS complex and a greater voltage in the terminal part and as a result the VI upon VT ratio will be equal or less than 1. So if any of this one criteria is present in lead AVR then that wide complex tachycardia is more likely to be a ventricular tachycardia. So the last question is when you have a wide complex tachycardia what is the cutoff for the QRS duration when you have a RBBB and a LBBB like morphology to call it a possible case of VT. So if a VT presents as an RBBB like morphology and if its duration is more than 140 milliseconds then it is more likely to be a VT over SVT with aberrancy and if there is an LBBB like morphology to that wide complex tachycardia and if it is more than 160 milliseconds of duration then it is again more likely to be a VT over SVT with aberrancy. One of the most important points to know is that if the patient has any presence of structural heart disease, any risk factors towards a coronary artery disease for example or if the patient has had a prior myocardial infarction then the likelihood of ventricular tachycardia is more than 95%. So even if you are not able to differentiate this particular wide complex tachycardia as VT or SVT, you can still consider it to be a default case of VT if there is any history of any structural heart disease. So like always, like, share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon and I'll see you next time with another video.